Hey, welcome to I Don't Get the Bible. I'm Sean McCraney. This is Delaney McCraney, my youngest daughter. And uh, after years of different uh, religious experiences and, I mean, education, uh, Delaney still hasn't gotten the Bible. <laughs> and so we have, we have decided to sit down and figure out what this thing says. And we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 2. Okay. Um, Paul is speaking to Corinthians. Yeah. And he the first verse is I, in previous chapters I have maybe synthesized things and I feel like Corinthians I'm starting to get into this pattern where I have like blocks of a couple verses that I will Good. ask you questions about rather than single verses except this first verse. Paul tells the people that he intentionally didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell God's secret plan. That's how it mm. describes it. But I'm thinking secret plan also means testimony in other. Oh, I didn't know that. In other God's mystery or God's testimony. Mystery, yeah. I thought that was a really weird phrase, God's secret plan, but it had a comment about it. Mm. Um, but he intentionally didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom. And then he's, he says, while I was with you, I'd forget everything except Jesus. And we, I came to you in weakness, timid and troubling. And my message and my preaching were very plain rather than using clever and persuasive speeches. He relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but the power of God. Mm -hmm. And my question here is mostly personal like you do this and i've always to be truthful i've always sort of read it as like those are kind of like tactics for manipulation too mm. like changing changing your approach for different people oh. to like hear what they want mm. but that's not what that's not what he's doing mm. and it it was really interesting to see that paul speaks plainly that he does this to them mm -hmm. and i'm not saying you're like you tell people you're doing that too it's not like but i just wondered if you could like articulate how they're different like how it's not manipulation well i think probably it is a manipulation but it's a manipulation that is according to the circumstance so uh it's just like if you're talking to a, a five-year-old you're going to change the way you talk to them than if you were talking to a 30 year old. And so are you manipulating that five year old? Well, you've manipulated your approach to them because they're not going to get it. If you just come at them with the same standard message yeah. at the same standard level. And so, uh, but the beautiful thing about that is that's how God works. He comes to you where you're at. If you are, you know, a drunk lane in the street, whatever, he will come down to that level. Yeah. And, uh, and if you're elevated in a, in an ivory tower, he'll reach you at that level. Mm. And so Paul will say, I become all things to all men. Yeah. Yeah. That principle is weird to me. Yeah. No, it's really necessary. It's necessary as a parent. Mm. It's necessary in engaging with all people, but you look like you're manipulating. Yeah. The, you the the articulating of it in that way sounds like it's manipulative mm -hmm. the act of it doesn't like i feel like you you know even in your teachings you used to do like milk and meat like and you're forthright about it it's not like you're mm -hmm. hiding something i feel manipul like manip manipulation comes with hiding things like if someone were to press you yeah. If a five-year-old understood better and kept asking, you'd tell yeah, them. It's you not like you're more withholding. Yeah, but I also, it feels like it conflicts with how Jesus was, where he, it felt like Jesus could be described as like giving these really powerful and incomprehensible truths mm -hmm. that no, that was on nobody's level. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you're going to get it someday sort of thing. Yeah. And there's a time and place for that too, it seems. Yes, there is. And Jesus also, remember, he had to speak the truth. 
And so if he was presented with a concept, he had to include everything about that concept in his mm. response. But he also had to, uh, but he also um, edited his messages where he didn't give everything at, at once. He met people where they were. He mm -hmm. gave them the truth. It's tough. You're, and it's interesting that you see it this way because it takes a discerning eye to understand that's what's going on. And so you can become discerning and you can become critical mm -hmm. of an individual who's changing. That's what people, that's what my critics, uh, there's a major one here in the state. Mm. He says, that's all I do is change. I'm not changing. You're not changing at all. I'm trying to, like, I think just, like I said, the, the spoken principle, like reading, I become all things to all people, or like, I changed, like, rather than use clever, I relied on the, I don't know, just reading it without the examples of it happening sounds weird to me and it always has, but like it, it makes it rely, like it makes you evaluate what the motivation is of what you're doing, which is for Paul, he's saying he's relying on the power of the Holy spirit and that's what you do too. Try. And yeah, for sure. And like, there's also just a time and place. I don't know. Like, There's a time and place. This is just uh, being a human and having a conversation. You can't get all the facts in any way. No. But. You have to consider your audience. You have to consider in that their level of understanding. Yeah. You yeah. have to consider uh, then if you're a good, honest communicator, never saying anything that contradicts but you do give things that don't seem to be congruent with what you've said before. Yeah. It's only because the audience has changed. Yeah. It's not because what you stand you, for has changed. Yeah. Yeah. That, Paul's reason for being that way was because the uh, Greeks are so, so philosophical. And so he's just pointing out here yeah. in Greece, I'm not coming and using that. I'm just coming and bringing something different. Yeah, I think my questions are trying to get at like what what's the reason that the message of like the good news is like this? Like why is it that it manifests this way? And I think your your reasons too in the same way that Paul's are like it's it's by the spirit, it's subjective and it's a really big picture. And there were ages of different types of things going, like there's just so much to it that like you could speak to a philosopher about it in terms of philosophy and you could speak to a drug addict about it in terms right. of like addiction. Like yes. you, you could speak to everybody about it in terms of, because it's a universal thing. It's just love. That's right. So that's why it's you becoming all things to all people. It's yeah. not out of manipulation. Oh no, but it's out of love. And it's be just like a parent out of love will not speak above their child. Mm -hmm. Mommy, daddy, you know, they're going to try to take out of love, reach them where they understand. Yeah. And that's the thing what God does. And we forget that, you know, some religionists think God is like, this is my law. It will be set. You too bad if you get it or not. No way. Yeah. Very different. God changing. Yeah. And I, I'm also trying to, see if you have a way of um articulating how someone can point out when it's manipulation versus love like because they have similar things about them but it seems like love like you speaking to two different crowds in different ways is for their benefit yeah. and manipulation would be for your benefit yeah. It seems like that is how I, you distinguish the two. That's that's a, that's an element to do it. Sure, is I think there also others? sure. If I'm trying to get you to uh, do something uh, in my presentation through guilt, through uh, oh. if I'm trying to manipulate you to feel bad, uh, to uh, get you to then, uh, I mean, feeling bad it works too. Mm -hmm. There's a purpose for that. It's when it's when people are blinded by doctrine, mm -hmm. you have to get them to break sometimes 
So it really depends, you know, on the audience. But if you're trying to trap them, if you find that what a person's doing is to get you to become someone who serves them, mm -hmm. pays money, mm -hmm. <coughs> is yeah. threatened with hell, those signals, you know, should come up. Yeah. But if the if it's just misunderstanding because there's a depth difference, too bad. You know, yeah. you're gonna be misunderstood if you understand the full scope. It's like when someone comes up and says, "Jesus came." Do you believe Jesus already returned? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, what about? And they ask you one question. Yeah. And you have 20 years of yeah. research on it. It's so difficult to be able to just enter in and that's what people want today. Yeah. So you have to try to engage them with rhetorical devices to get them to start to think yeah. and that you are you manipulating your mind to do it? Yes. Yeah. But it's all for them to be free. Yeah. If you hear the messages to make people free, I think you can say okay, thank you, you know. Yeah. But if it's to put them in bondage in any way, you can know you're being manipulated in the wrong way. Yeah, okay. That's a that seems like a like you could go to a church this happens all the time with people that i know where they go to their church the church is doing manipulative things but the impression is like well they're the church they must be like not that they're saying Speaking they do all God. things for all people but they're they're of that spirit where they're like trying their best and but like i don't know yeah, well, church is just, I mean, bottom line, religion is idolatry. Hmm. Um, that's, that's, I'll just say that. And if you don't understand that, that's because there's a lot behind that statement. Hmm. You know, Old Testament, New Testament, it's idolatry because it inserts itself between the individual and God. In my messages to people, I always say, I can be wrong, don't trust me, but this is how I see it. Hmm. And you give them the liberty to grow in it or not. Hmm. Okay. So. Well, that was the first verse. The first few verses. Okay, let's keep going. When he says, "When I, when I'm among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of words of wisdom that belong to this world or the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten." Um, no, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, His plan that was previously hidden, even though He made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. Um, first of all, like the idea that there are mature believers is like the second part of what we we're just talking about. Like it's both like what type of person it is and their age and their interest or whatever, but also like maturity in their belief is a thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what Paul, like, you just think that that's like a principle and it's nice to see where it's written in, yeah. in the Bible and how it's used and what the, it actually means to be a mature, mature believer. Yeah. And the sad reality Delaney is that as you mature as a believer in the word, mm -hmm. you will become more and more alienated from those who aren't. And then you become more and more alienated from a lot more people as you mature. And pretty soon you're pretty much alone. Mm. So that's why, you know, our Grady down in, in Mexico and, and I talk every morning. He's been alone 27 years. Mm. You get alienated because people don't understand you. Mm. But there's so there's a price for that maturity. But it's the same thing with Jesus. You know, mm. at first he was popular, but as he continued to deliver them deeper things, they turned from him. Mm. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. And it's sobering. Even to the smallest degree, yes. I understand it. So I can't imagine being a freaking scholar knowing all the stuff. And, and then also, I mean, that isn't that a type of what Christ teaches is mm. the world around you is going to be focused on its things mm. and it all understands and they know all the cool stuff mm -hmm. and you become more and more and more removed. And so it's very hard to be a loving person then because you mm -hmm. get angry at the way it treats you mm -hmm. and you get depressed. So it is a sorrowful growth yeah. and most people don't want it. They just say no, but the rewards for it are incomprehensible and internally. You can't beat it. How would you describe the rewards? The rewards are you are equipped to love. And when you're equipped to love people, 
unconditionally and in every way possible, you are liberated, you're free. Mm. You don't have to worry about how you look, what you say, how, what you eat. You don't have to worry about anything. You love them. Mm -hmm. And you could be brought in with the worst person and you love them and the world hates that mm. because they want to, you know, get them. Yeah. Love liberates. I'm I've been realizing too that the like it's almost just like a logistical thing like you spent it's where you spend your time. Oh yeah. Like you lit, people it's not just that they are interested in something else but like also believers and can relate to you on it. They spend their time getting better at this one thing and you're, you're spending time getting better at another and it like there's just nothing to talk about because you don't think yeah. about each other's yeah exactly <laughs> and i, I want to say something too god has given us a world uh, and he's given all of us talents and gifts to use in our lives we have lives they're important mm. so i don't look down on someone who doesn't do what i do it, you know, we've been watching the uh, Last Dance documentary. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful, man. I could almost cry at the talents of these basketball players and the entertainment they bring. And they choose to focus on that. And I don't judge them. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their reward. And it's a great reward. And I don't think they're going to be punished for being NBA rich, uh, successful basketball players in the future. I think God loves them. He's going to give them a great future. But when you choose to seek him in this life, instead of try to do something in the life, there's a different price and there's a different reward. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm trusting that the reward after this life will be God will take those who were really dedicated to him and he'll use them to reach the dark. Mm -hmm. And it would be a, it's a servant's place it's not a, i'm a god mm -hmm. it's a i'm a servant to try to help you it's mm -hmm. the same model jesus was you know and that's and that's my hope i want to be used in that way without my flesh getting in the way afterward mm -hmm. and that and people i know who've grown in the faith they have the same mindset they're not mm -hmm. thinking they're going to be glorious they're thinking i get to be used by god to reach those who are lost that is so wild. Isn't it? But there isn't like flesh up there. No. So it makes me wonder like what it is that they're choosing outside of God up there. I think what they're doing is they are thriving in what they um, know and loved. And like I have there's a, a will. Like, oh, there's always a will. Is there still a will up there? Oh, sure. Like. That's why the gates are open day and night. Mm -hmm. There's a will. Yeah. And so you can use this life to make your will his, or you can mm. use this life to exercise your will. I think in the afterlife, everybody's own will will continue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think God punishes them. He loves us. He loved the world, right? So he's going to love the world there. And I, I, I really do, and this is strange, but I really do believe that the economy of heaven's just like this one. We'll mm -hmm. have communities interested in different things, they're loved, they're provided for, whatever it is. Um, but I just think there will be something subtly different when we're outside of these bodies. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it has to be something like that because everything that the Bible um, talks about and even just the idea of love, which is what how God is defined, is about like people and then like people together yeah and groups yes like that's like the focus of everything yeah so it would make sense that there's like socialization or yes. something up there which is why i am so adamantly passionately driven to say christianity is not a culture mm. it's not a group it's a mindset, it's a heart set. Mm. But on earth, everyone wants to make it a culture. Mm -hmm. And we all we, we want to be exclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, no one wants to be inclusive. Just to be clear though, that sounds like I'm saying it's Christianity is like about people and like how, maybe like how you approach group. Like groups exist. Yes. Like systems exist and love is like non either of those you'd say like 
Christianity and its expression of love is like it outside of systems and groups transcends or, all of it completely. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. that, like our human, like flesh is systems yeah. to me. Like yeah. flesh is systematizing or abstracting things yeah. that can't, that aren't abstract yeah. and love transcends them. That's right. And so why in the flesh do we systematize? Do you think? Like biology, like survival. Survival, there's unity in numbers, there's power and strength, fear. Yeah. It's an us versus them. All flesh, flesh gathers in cultures to protect themselves, to yeah. feel certain, to feel right. Yeah. But the love God brings to you says, I love whatever group you are. Yeah. Come on, baby. Yeah. Someone recently commented on your point that like idolatry, like we're born into idolatry just by our need to have food. Air and, and oxygen. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, it's just like a, in principle, yeah. like it's not, well, it's not like we worship food and stuff, oh, no. but like we just instinctually have to have things. Yes. Meaning like there is something that's above God. Like if you're about to die, you're going to think, how do I stop dying right yeah. now? Like instinctually, you can decide I'm going to stop thinking about that and choose God. Yeah. But like in your nature, you're going to pick to how to survive. And, and so what people have done historically to counter that is monasticism. They've said, I'm oh. going to rid myself of all desire. That's what Buddhism teaches. Mm. I'm, I'm not gonna allow myself to have desires. And, and the difference between Eastern philosophy and Christianity is Eastern philosophy says, lose yourself mm. completely, all your desires and enter into Nirvana, right? Mm. But Christianity, Christ teaches, no, be yourself. Wow. Just submit yourself to him and let him use you. That is so crazy. Yeah. That's like precisely what I've been, what I have been struggling with. It's huh. like, ha that's the like saving part of Christianity is finding out that I should have a self. Yes. Like it's, in, it's in, like love doesn't exist without me having a self that's strong that I yeah. sacrifice. And a choice, yes. Yeah. Right. And so therefore you then are responsible for yeah. the choices made. You see how it's all cycling yeah. into a, a And that makes for like a lifelong project <sighs> rather than like Buddhism losing yourself seems like there's yeah, nirvana yeah. Right? like you can get there yeah. and like be done. And what's the focus? Self. Yeah. Self, self, self. True. Yeah, exactly. In Christianity, you're not focusing on self. You're focusing on him and he takes you and he says, you be who I made you to be. Yeah. The best that you are. Yeah. Yeah. It, that was where I started. Like I thought Christianity was losing yourself and that made me the most selfish version of myself. I've ever yes. Been. It was like this. Yeah. Yeah. And it leads to freaking mental illness. Oh, like it's yeah. bad. How are we doing on time? You Not said bad, we want to keep it at 20 minutes. Yeah, we're at 23, so we should move on. But. I have to ga I have to gauge these things. <laughs> He's got a clock in that head. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye. <laughs>